right, so hello everyone and welcome to our very last What Physicists Do of the Spring 2021 semester. Today it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stacy Kopp, who comes from to us from UC Irvine. So Stacy got her bachelor's in both mathematics and physics at the University of Arizona. She then got her master's and PhD in physics at UC Santa Barbara before um, heading over to Los Alamos National Lab for her postdoctoral position, and then finally ended up in actually the materials and engineering department at UC Irvine. So today she'll be telling us about her work studying uh, programmable light matter interactions and DNA as a tool for nanophotonics. So thank you for being here today, Stacy. Um, take it away. Thanks very much, Professor Miller. And for uh, the invitation from both you and the rest of the physics department at Sonoma State University. And I'm going to begin my talk today actually by defining a word which is in the title that's nanophotonics. And then I'll ask for some participation from the audience before we go into the bulk of the talk. So I'm, I want to define this word nanophotonics. And if my slides will cooperate. Ah, okay, for some reason when I do the laser pointer, it doesn't let me advance the slides. Let me use the button. Okay, so let's begin first by defining the word photonics. Uh, photonics is the science and technology of making and manipulating light. And you'll remember um, from a physics class that you've taken, hopefully, that light is an electromagnetic wave. Uh, this means that it contains both electric field um, varying components and magnetic field varying components. And a primary characteristic of an electromagnetic wave is its wavelength, which I'll represent by lambda. So depending on the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave, um, the wave will have different properties. Okay, I'm going to have to get rid of the laser pointer because it keeps exiting the zoom window. I apologize. Hopefully you can see the regular pointer. Alas. Okay, um, so here is a snapshot of part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the portion which we uh, consider light is strictly defined as the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's also um, x-rays, for example, if you've had a um, x-ray for a broken bone or other medical event recently, those x-rays have a wavelength that's one one billionth of a meter. And then visible light has uh, wavelengths that are closer to one one millionth of a meter. But for the sake of photonics, typically what we're talking about is the visible electromagnetic spectrum, which our eyes can see, and also surrounding portions of ultraviolet spectrum and um, infrared spectrum. So that's what I'm talking about when I say the word light in this talk. Now, light is also a particle. Um, and by that, I mean that a um, light is quantized and it um, comes in the form of wave packets, which I'm representing here by this little picture. Um, but for the sake of this talk, just remember that light has a, a wavelength. I also realize now that all of your faces are over my slides. I apologize. So now I can't see any of you. Okay. So one key um, factor of light is what's so-called uh, the diffraction limit. Now, for those who have taken an optics class, maybe you've um, drawn some of these ray diagrams where if you have a lens like this microscope objective, um, the light is focused um, and you draw these rays. And at this focal point here, you might think that the light is infinitely focused to a tiny point, but actually that's not correct. Um, light of a given wavelength lambda has a limited uh, focal width or beam waste given by this equation here. So light with wavelength lambda um, is limited to uh, this finite sized spot. As an example, if I have a blue laser, uh, so a common laser in the lab um, is an argon laser, and an argon laser has a wavelength of 488 nanometers. If I focus that with a water droplet, 
um, at an angle of about 30 degrees, this is limited to a spot size of about 200 nanometers. So why does this matter? Well, if we think about what um, 200 nanometers is relative to various objects, 200 nanometers is about right at this dashed line. And there are many objects which are smaller than 200 nanometers, things like viruses, which have sort of overtaken our lives recently, um, and then even molecules smaller than that, and also parts of our cells, so parts of uh, mitochondria and bacteria and mammal cells have dimensions smaller than 200 nanometers. What that means is that we can't really resolve those structures uh, with light as I'm showing you here with just a typical microscope. So the field of either getting more out of light um, than just what's limited by diffraction or squeezing light into smaller, um, smaller areas is uh, related to the field of nanophotonics and also super resolution imaging. So nanophotonics is the study of light with nanometer scale objects that are smaller than this diffraction limit. It's one way to beat the diffraction limit. We can use metallic and dielectric materials that have dimensions in one or more directions smaller than this wavelength of light lambda to squeeze, scatter, concentrate, and twist light in some pretty dramatic ways. These um, schematics over here on the left show you just a few examples. So here, for example, is a waveguide uh, where this dimension in the vertical direction is smaller than the wavelength of light, and it can squeeze and um, increase, or excuse me, decrease the wavelength of light within this waveguide. You can also take two metal nanoparticles and amplify light emission from, say, a blue particle here. This could be used for energy efficient lighting or you could twist light in certain ways or change its direction. All of these are things that one can do by exploiting uh, nanophotonics. So some applications of nanophotonics are um, sensing, especially for medical diagnostics. Um, some of the earliest applications of um, nanophotonics were in this area. You can also exploit nanophotonics for treating cancers. So you can take tiny nanoparticles like these gold nanoparticles here and concentrate light in order to generate heat. And that heat can destroy cancer cells. Uh, nanophotonics is also used for communication, for enhancing solar, um, solar cells and other photovoltaics and for computing. And for all of these applications, materials are central to the nanophotonic properties. Um, this is because we need to control the size and shape of nanoscale objects um, in order to get these precise photonic properties. So um, my research is primarily focused on how can we engineer materials with nanoscale dimensions that will give us um, photonic properties that we desire. So now I want to ask you a question as the audience. Now that I've defined the words nanophotonics and photonics, I want you to take a few minutes and think about what comes to mind when you think about materials or devices or technologies that are used to make and manipulate light. So if we were in a normal lecture hall, you could just shout them out at me, but I'm gonna ask you to type them into the chat and then I'll take a look at what's in the chat. Okay, solar panels, great. What else? You can also unmute yourselves and shout them out. Uh, metamaterials, fiber optic cables. Photography, yep. All right, anybody else? Okay, so yes, these are um, that one quantum detector. <laughs> that must have been from a previous uh, seminar. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, common ways that we as humans 
make and manipulate light um, include some of the examples that you mentioned. So for example, here is a photovoltaic cell that was carefully fabricated in a clean room. So you can see the person's wearing gloves, the cell looks very pristine and it's got this pattern if you look really closely. Um, we also generate light with precise wavelengths with lasers or light emitting diodes and then uh, metamaterials as Professor Miller mentioned, these are nanophotonic structures um, that can selectively scatter certain wavelengths and control light um, in very precise ways. Also, these types of chips are made in a clean room um, and it's a very laborious process to assemble something like this. So when I think of photonic technologies, I think of a different paradigm. I think of things from nature. Um, so this is the field of biophotonics, the complex photonic materials that nature has developed over vast amounts of time. So for example, if you look inside of certain uh, plants and you look in their leaves at the cells that absorb light and then do photosynthesis, you can find nanostructured materials. So this is a scale bar that says two microns, kind of hard to read. Uh, but this is a nanophotonic material because it has dimensions or stacks that are smaller than the wavelength of light. And those stacks actually act to selectively uh, scatter certain wavelengths. And scientists believe that they might be important in enhancing the light absorption of certain plants that live on the forest floor. So biology is exploiting nanophotonics. There's another cool example in this fish. Some of you might have this in your aquarium, actually. It's called a neon tetra. And uh, I got one of these a few years ago for my kid because I thought she might like fish. Turned out she didn't care about them. Um, but one morning I came and turned on the tank. And as a new fish owner, I was horrified because the fish's blue stripes were gone and I thought I had killed them. But within about five minutes, their blue stripes were back. And then I learned. Um, that scientists had found out that these fish have the same type of photonic crystals as these plants. And they can control the um, shape of these crystals, it's sort of like your blinds in your apartment, in order to selectively scatter blue light towards your eye. So fish are also using nanophotonics. Then there's the firefly, which we don't really have in this part of the country as much. Um, but this, this fly has this complex chemical reaction involving enzymes in its abdomen, and it's producing this glowing light. But also, uh, it has a nanostructured pattern on the abdomen, which is shown here with an electron microscopy image. And the dimensions of these things that look to me like scales um, and are called cuticles in this diagram, they are perfectly tuned so that their dimensions couple to the wavelength of light that this firefly makes. And in fact, these um, nanophotonic scales are critical to scattering the light out of the firefly's abdomen, um, much brighter than it would be if it were just a smooth abdomen. And then perhaps the most beautiful example of biophotonics in nature is photosynthesis. So if you have taken a quantum mechanics class, I encourage you to go read about photosynthesis after the fact, um, especially light harvesting. It's really fascinating. And um, there are all of these nanoscale groups of molecules within uh, the photosynthetic apparatus that are arranged so that when a photon is captured, that energy gets funneled through this cool process called non-radiative energy transfer to the point of the um, photosynthetic apparatus where you separate an electron in a hole. Um, so in fact, quantum mechanics may also be crucial in multiple other ways to photosynthesis. So what all of these, these examples of um, biomaterials have in common is that unlike what I showed you on the past slide, where you have some very carefully fabricated solar cell or some very pristine light emitting diode, these things involve soft, squishy materials. They're messy, they're dynamic. Um, they're multifunctional. So for example, um, the fish is more than just a blue stripe, right? It's also a fish that eats things and swims around. So achieving this kind of dynamic response, um, multifunctionality 
and hierarchical behavior is something that's really challenging to achieve in hard materials that we process in a clean room, um, but could be achieved if we could harness soft materials, like what these animals and plants are made of, in order to create complex um, nanophotonic assemblies. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about my path um, to becoming a materials physicist who studies biophotonics. Then I will talk about a specific challenge within nanophotonics, and that is realizing precise nanostructures. And I'll tell you how we are overcoming this using DNA as a building block for materials. So to begin, um, I'm from New Mexico, over here. New Mexico is a state and not part of Mexico, <laughs> uh, which seems weird to say, but it's actually a question I get about why my English is so good. It's kind of embarrassing. People don't know that. Um, so for college, I went down to Tucson, Arizona, and I got a bachelor's in physics and math. Um, but before college, I was also interested in many other things, and I still am, um, things like music, history, running, so I think it's good to have multiple, multiple interests, but I was really encouraged to study physics and math by an excellent high school teacher who I'm still grateful for. And then while I was at the University of Arizona, I was also fortunate to have listened to advice um, to get involved in research experiences and get involved in them early. So I did research at both the University of Arizona and at some Department of Energy National Labs in some pretty different areas, um, from nuclear physics to biophysics to optical physics. I also was mentored by excellent faculty and graduate students who encouraged me to consider graduate school after undergrad. And importantly, I met my future husband. Then in grad school, I kept going west um, and spent five years in Santa Barbara where I got a PhD in physics. Again, I was mentored by some excellent faculty who I was fortunate to do research with. And I was also introduced to nanomaterials, um, optical nanomaterials. I also got to travel nationally and internationally to different conferences, which is something that I didn't know was a part of graduate school, um, but often you get to travel a lot. So that's a fun perk getting to travel and meeting people from all over the world. And we had our first daughter at the end of our PhDs. And then as a postdoc, um, which a postdoctoral fellowship is typically something one does after you get your PhD um, to get some different experience for a limited amount of time before you start a permanent position. I returned home to New Mexico and I worked for Los Alamos National Lab um, which is the Department of Energy National Lab. I actually worked off site at the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies, which is down in Albuquerque as my hometown. And because of my fellowship, I got the unique opportunity to uh, run and direct my own research program, which was a good experience for me. And we had our second daughter who was very grumpy and is the subject of many memes now. <laughs> Um, and because uh, the experience that I had at the National Lab showed me that I love research and teaching, um, I'm now here at UC Irvine. And um, my growing research group includes three grad students here, um, two undergrads currently, and a few who have since graduated. Um, and hopefully our numbers will be growing in the fall as well. And I also do want to point out that we're fortunate to both have UCI undergrads and um, undergraduates from local community colleges. So if you're a community college student tuning in, um, or if you transferred from a community college, do seek out those research opportunities because they're also present and um, important for your career. And my interests are broadly in what are called soft bio-inspired materials. Um, I'm interested in both their fundamental science and the promise that they hold for technologies. On the fundamental side, um, soft materials, which are defined basically as things which are squishy, so they respond to stimulus, unlike the um, chip in your phone. One property that these have is called self-assembly, and 
this, uh, we are all now familiar with pictures of viruses, right? So sorry, I'm not showing you the, the coronavirus because we don't want to see that again. Um, but there is a fascinating property of things like viruses, which is that all of these soft, squishy molecules are encoded or programmed with the information needed to assemble or self-assemble into some ordered structure. So if you have all of these different pieces of DNA, RNA, and proteins, um, they have this information encoded so that they will form a viral capsid, for example. And they can do this repeatedly and even in a messy environment like your cell. And harnessing this property of self-assembly in order to build materials from the bottom up is one big goal within materials physics. Another property of soft bio-inspired materials or soft biological materials is what we call multi-length scale order. So to get an idea of what this is, let's consider something like a squid. Um, squid have these iridescent colors that they can tune um, with these cells, which are called iridophores um, or iridocytes. And a squid is typically about a meter long, but these cells are typically about one micron long. And then with each of, within each of these cells, there are these nanoscale proteins that are arranged in this perfect way such that this squid is shiny and it can dynamically control its iridescence. So this is an example of multi-link scale order in matter. And it's something which is very challenging for humans to replicate. Soft materials are also inherently um, responsive to stimulus. Things like temperature, light, force, um, pH, and all of this can be harnessed for technologies and sensing. Soft materials are also important for medical applications because we are made of soft materials. And some of them can be more biodegradable um, than currently used material systems. So all of these are reasons why I'm interested in and excited about soft materials. My laboratory at UCI is focused on harnessing a specific kind of soft material called a macromolecule. And it is what it sounds like. It means big molecule. And we want to harness these as programmable building blocks for materials. We're focused on information encoding macromolecules, things like DNA, which encodes your genetic um, information, or peptides, which are tiny uh, versions of proteins and then synthetic polymers that also have different chemical groups along the, the polymer backbone. And we use DNA to create uh, luminescent silver clusters that can be used for uh, medical imaging and biosensing. We are also interested in DNA and peptides as a way to build nanoelectronics made out of soft materials. And we're interested in controlling um, the self-assembly process in block copolymers and nanoparticles. And a theme of my research as um, a physicist is that I use tools from machine learning and data mining when we can't use what are called first principles models. So these are models that we build from starting from physics equations um, to address this complexity. So a lot of these soft materials um, are so complex that theorists are still developing um, models, theoretical models, which can describe this self-assembly process or the electronic or photonic um, properties of these materials. And today I'm going to focus on uh, these materials here for the second half of the talk. So uh, next, let me tell you a little bit about one of the big challenges for the field of nanophotonics. So nanophotonics um, relies on having precise nanomaterials. And that's because the properties, size and shape of nanomaterials um, precisely control the way that light interacts with that material. So here's an example. Um, these are optical spectra for silver nanorods. And the exact details here, um, you don't have to worry about, but what I want you to look at is um, that this nanorod, all we're doing is we're growing it in length a little bit. And when it's a short nanorod, like this one here, the spectrum is given by this turquoise or cyan line, um, which also has the 
excuse me, the, the black line, which also has the square symbols. But as we grow the length of the nano rod, we change the optical spectrum to this um, blue line here. Hopefully, if you're colorblind, you can see my cursor. So even small shifts in the length of the nano rod can change its optical spectrum and therefore change the way that this nanoparticle interacts with light. And if you want a very precise material that will interact with light in a predictable way, uh, this can be a problem. The reason why this is a problem is that all nanoparticles are not created equal, no matter how hard you try. So here I'm showing you some 3D reconstructions of some platinum nanoparticles that were made in the same vial at the same time. So if you look even for particles one through six, um, which aren't expected to have big, big defects, you can see that for three different projections here, these nanoparticles do not look the same. Their size and shape is not exactly the same. And that means that the way that they interact with light is going to be somewhat different. So one of the biggest challenges in nanophotonics is realizing extremely precise nanomaterials and their arrangement um, so that we can have extreme precision over the interactions of these materials with light. And one way to overcome this is by harnessing what are called clusters. Clusters are materials that lie um, in the, the length spectrum between what we think of as molecules, so that might be something like this with a defined number of, of atoms and defined bonds. Um, I also haven't taken chemistry since I was in high school, so it's possible to do um, chemical physics without diving into the chemistry in your undergraduate studies. And um, they also lie between what we think of as nanoparticles, where you start having bulk properties arising. Um, so here you might think of uh, this as what's called a face-centered cubic lattice, where all of the atoms are arranged in a particular way um, with uniform spacing. And as this nanoparticle would grow, it would become a chunk of metal, um, which might conduct electricity, for example. At the cluster regime, we transition between what's typically thought of as a molecule and a nanoparticle. And with that structural transi transition, we get a transition in the electronic and optical properties as well. The fun thing from a physicist's point of view is that we don't still know a lot about clusters. Um, and understanding both their structural properties and their functional properties, like optical and electronic properties, is an active and fun area of research. Clusters are useful in part because they can be atomically precise. So here is um, from this paper below, what they called their um, practical cookbook for atomically precise gold nanoclusters. And if you look at each of these balls here, um, each of these is a different gold atom you can see that the gold atoms are arranged in these beautiful and complex cages, um, depending on how these chemists made these. Metal clusters um, are the smallest of nanoparticles, and typically they are not stable unless they have some armor, these types of molecules on the left, that protect them from aggregating and forming big pieces of metal. One of the most fascinating properties of, of clusters is that they can act as what are called super atoms. Um, that means that the electrons that live on each of these gold atoms, for example, can delocalize and then live across the entire cluster. So just like you think of the electrons around, say, a helium atom um, as having certain energy levels, the cluster itself will also have certain electronic orbitals um, that results in certain energy levels for the electrons within the cluster. And this results in the fact um, that certain clusters with what we call magic numbers of electrons are much more stable, just like on the periodic table. Um, when you look at the noble gases like helium, argon, etc., cetera, um, those gases are much more stable and they don't form bonds um, with most other elements because they have filled electronic shells. 
So these magic number properties are part of why we can realize atomically precise clusters. And this atomic precision enables pot potentially the ultimate control over photonic properties of a nanoparticle. So I'm going to tell you how we're using DNA as a way to build certain metal clusters. Um, and then how we're using that DNA to create these silver clusters that can be used for bioimaging. So let me begin by reminding you what DNA is. Um, DNA, which you probably have learned about in biology classes, um, is the molecule which encodes your genetic information. But when I look at this as a materials physicist, I see actually a precise material building block, which is programmable. So let me explain. Um, this DNA molecule contains some sequence of the four nucleobases. And for this talk, we can just call them A, C, G, and T. We know that A pairs with T and C pairs with G in order to form the, what's called the Watson-Crick double helix. This double helix will only form if you have the right sequence on both of these DNA molecules, which are these gray ribbons, and it will form this predictable and precise structure, which has about two nanometer diameter and about 3.4 nanometer helical turn. And by harnessing this molecularly encoded interaction, scientists have been able to engineer the sequences of many different DNA molecules to fold into complex shapes. In other words, you can use pieces of DNA to do this self-assembly process where all of the molecules will find their places based on some pre-programmed information and form a complex structure. This is just one example, um, but people have created DNA origami and other types of um, two and three dimensional nanostructures that can even control where nanoparticles sit. They can encapsulate a drug um, or they can sense the presence of some molecule. We are interested in using DNA as this kind of programmable building block, but specifically we use it to encapsulate those types of metal clusters that I just showed you. So let me introduce you to the DNA stabilized silver cluster. This is the material um, that we work with. These clusters contain about 10 to 30 silver atoms. So they're very small, um, only about one to a few nanometers in size. And they're stabilized by one or two, or maybe even three um, short pieces of single-stranded DNA. That's what oligomer means. It means a piece of single-stranded DNA. So not the double-stranded helix on the previous slide, half of that double helix. These are very easy to make. Um, I'm a physicist, so I don't really do complicated chemistry. Um, we can combine DNA with a silver salt. And then after some short amount of time, we can add a chemical that's called a reducing agent and that um, catalyzes the formation of clusters. And if we've done this properly, after some amount of time, a few hours or a few days, we'll find that our tube is glowing. And that glowing is coming from these DNA stabilized silver clusters. So specifically, the type of glowing um, is called fluorescence. This is light emission after we excite the cluster with light. In this case, we're using a black light, um, kind of like you might see at a party or something, um, in order to excite the fluorescence. So what exactly is going on during a fluorescence process? Um, we can have some kind of molecule or cluster that lives in a ground state um, without external stimulus. And it will have some set of ground state energy orbitals, which I'm numbering here, one, two, three, et cetera. If this molecule or cluster absorbs a photon, then this cluster could be promoted up into some excited states here labeled S1. And then typically what will happen is some energy will be lost to what are called non-radiative transitions. This could be the molecule wiggling around um, or otherwise doing a process we call relaxation. And then it can fall back down to the ground state through a process called fluorescence, emitting another photon. 
So this is the process going on within these silver clusters. The fluorescence properties of DNA stabilized silver clusters, I'll call them AGDNAs for short, are really favorable for two reasons. One is there's a diverse color palette of these clusters. So here I'm showing you the absorbent spectrum of certain DNA stabilized silver clusters. You can see that it spans from 400 nanometers up past 700 nanometers, so into this near infrared region. Um, or here's another way to visualize this. And what's primarily selecting the color of these clusters is the DNA sequence. So in a sense, this is why we say that DNA can be a genome for metal clusters. I put genome in quotations. And there's another um, favorable property of these clusters that is that they can be very brightly fluorescent. fluorescent. Um, so one measure of this is what's called the quantum yield. Um, it's the fraction of photons that will be emitted by the cluster per number of photons that it absorbs. Um, so these clusters can have very high quantum yields. They can also have narrow line widths, meaning that these spectra here and also the fluorescent spectra are not very broad and that can be useful for applications. Now what's primarily choosing the color of the DNA stabilized silver cluster is the DNA sequence, which will select the number of silver atoms within the cluster. And as the silver cluster grows in size, its wavelength, so its color, um, will increase. And so it will go from blue to green to red to near infrared. So these are a really tunable set of nanomaterials, um, which could be promising for applications. Now, you might have a question by now, um, which someone would have asked if I had been giving this talk in person. And that is, why do we use silver? Um, so there's two reasons. One is a chemical reason. Silver likes to bind to DNA bases, but not to the phosphate backbone of the DNA. So for example, silver can actually zip up entire pieces of DNA, replacing the Watson-Crick base pairing. And we believe that that forms a little pocket um, where we can then grow a slightly bigger silver cluster. Another reason is electronic or physics-based. Um, and that is that silver clusters are able to host what are called collective electronic excitations, meaning the electrons in the cluster will be moving together, so sloshing back and forth longitudinally along this rod or in a transverse direction. And as compared to something like gold, we can get these really strong um, intensity peaks in the excitation spectrum, um, meaning that all of the electrons are involved in the process. So it's a much more intense um, process. The reason why we don't see this in gold or other types of metals is because the electrons prefer to, in a singular fashion, hop between energy orbitals and not move collectively. So one um, important step in using these for nanophotonic applications is understanding what actually is the structure of the silver cluster. And until recently, we didn't have an actual atomic map of how the DNA attaches to the silver cluster. So we looked for clues based on how the color of the silver cluster trended with the, um, the size of the cluster. And I've shown you this, um, this plot before, but if we take a minute and look at it more closely, you can see there's actually a group of data points here, and then another group of data points here, and there's not too many data points in this region here. So we investigated this and found that this abundance of data points here corresponds to clusters with four neutral silver atoms. This corresponds to six neutral silver atoms. And then these, uh, which I don't have data for on this plot here, have higher numbers of neutral silver atoms. These are the so-called magic numbers of these clusters, meaning that certain numbers of electrons result in filled electronic shells. If the clusters were spheres, we would expect them to have magic numbers two, eight, and 20, so forth. Um, this is somewhat similar, but not exactly the same as the atomic numbers for the noble gases, by the way. Um, but silver clusters are obeying just even numbers um, for their magic numbers, and that suggests that they do not have a spherical symmetry. We can also um, compare their energy, the transition, or excuse me, the energies of their transitions 
to calculations for clusters with different sizes and shapes. And um, for clusters which are globular or spherical, we expect their transitions to be in the UV. But here, um, and I'm sorry, I'm plotting these as electron volts, um, but you can trust me here that this is the UV. Down here is the visible spectrum. And this blue line actually corresponds to a rod of silver atoms or a chain of silver atoms. So this was one of the first suggestions that perhaps um, these clusters might actually be rod-like. And I used to have to give this talk with a bunch of other plots and examples for why we believe that they were rods. But recently, about two years ago, um, the first atomic map of a DNA stabilized silver cluster was reported. And so here you can see each of the silver atoms as either gray or pink balls. And then you can see how the DNA is bending around the silver cluster, like some kind of cage. And there's two pieces of DNA around the silver cluster. So these really are um, cluster rods. They have much more rod-like shape than most other types of metal clusters that have been realized. And that makes them really interesting for basic physics reasons, um, but also potentially useful for applications. So what are some of the applications um, that these are used for? Other groups have developed different types of biomolecular sensors. For example, having a little cluster here um, that might be red if it's attached to a target piece of DNA associated with a disease and uh, green if otherwise. You can also use them as chemical sensors for toxic metal ions. Um, they've been used to label cells. So this is a microscopy image of different cells. You can see the nuclei are here in black um, and the silver clusters are decorating the outside of the cell. And then we've also used DNA, uh, like the DNA origami, in order to arrange these clusters into arrays, um, potentially moving towards their nanophotonic applications. And we've found that um, certain DNA stabilized silver clusters actually behave like larger plasmonic nanoparticles, meaning that the electrons do have some kind of collective electronic excitation, um, and that can be used for sensing. So all of these applications uh, require that we have to discover the DNA sequence um, that gives us the silver cluster with the certain properties that we desire. And this can be extremely challenging. The reason why this is challenging um, is because there are so many different um, DNA oligomers we can choose. So if we have four different nucleic acids, A, C, G, and T, if we have a string of N of them, there are four to the N possible sequences. And when we're stabilizing these silver clusters, we're typically using about 10 to 30 nucleobases. So we have literally trillions and trillions of different DNA sequences we can choose. This is obviously impossible to test experimentally. And also most of these DNA sequences don't allow us to create brightly fluorescent silver clusters. So for the really ideal clusters, we are looking for this needle in a haystack. We also can't use physics-based approaches. So starting from say quantum mechanics in order to simulate the clusters um, because it would simply take too long with current models. So what I propose to do as a graduate student and continue to do today um, is to harness high throughput experiments. So getting a lot of experimental data together with tools from machine learning to understand how DNA sequence is selecting the fluorescence color. So we have a, a robot that helps us make hundreds of these clusters in what are called well plates, meaning that there are little holes here um, that contain the fluid. And then we can do rapid fluorimetry. So that means measure the fluorescence properties of each of the silver clusters. And then we end up with a DNA library that connects each of these spectra here to a different DNA sequence. And it essentially becomes an informatics problem. We wanna map a DNA sequence onto an optical spectrum. So how do we do this? Uh, we are harnessing tools from machine learning and data mining for the study of materials. And this is a field called materials informatics, um, which is growing really rapidly in the past decade. For those of you who um, aren't familiar with machine learning. I like this, this little example here of what machine learning is. It's kind of colloquial. 
Um, machine learning studies computer algorithms for learning to do stuff based on some sorts of observation or data. That sounds really generic because it, it is. Um, there are tons of different machine learning algorithms that can do all kinds of different things. And in fact, um, if you have used a cell phone or watched a video on Netflix or something in the last year, which you surely have, you know that uh, Siri can recognize your voice, for example, um, and that's because of machine learning algorithms. And also Netflix knows in a creepy way how to recommend what to watch next. Um, so all of these are because of machine learning. In the field of materials, uh, we typically can make materials or maybe computationally simulate them. Um, but there are lots of ingredients that go into the materials, like the DNA sequence that we use to stabilize the clusters. So in order to go from these experiments we can do um, to better experiments that get us the materials we want, um, physicists and chemists and engineers like myself um, are using machine learning algorithms to close this loop here. So we put in, or ideally put in, uh, the physical insights we have about the material. So the known physics and chemistry. We use um, learning algorithms to learn how to say classify or predict um, properties of the material based on these inputs. And then we design new ingredients or processes for the materials um, and ideally also learn some interesting physics and chemistry in the process. And from my experience, um, it's really important not to use these algorithms as black boxes. Um, it's important to open the lid and look inside. So I'm going to tell you in some detail about what we're doing, um, because probably for many of you, some kind of um, informatics or machine learning is in your professional future. OK, so this is how we're harnessing machine learning to design DNA stabilized silver clusters. We first start by generating lots of experimental data, as I described to you. And then we use those so-called magic number properties of the clusters, and we sort the DNA sequences into different bins or different groups. Um, for example, most of the sequences don't create fluorescent silver clusters, so we call those dark. These are the bad examples we want to avoid. We also have these green clusters that have four neutral silver atoms, um, and then other groups of silver clusters that have different um, optical properties and sizes. We sort the, um, the sequences into these bins. And then the next step is one of the most challenging steps for machine learning. Um, it's called the feature engineering step. So the question we want to answer is, how can we take that DNA sequence, which is a string of four letters, A, C, G, and T, and turn it into some numbers that we put into our algorithm? And the way that we found to do this after a lot of experimentation uh, was to mine or to recognize certain patterns that were showing up in some of the classes of sequences, but not the others. So for example, we found that many of these green silver clusters had a lot of A's, or these red silver clusters had a lot of G's. And so we created vectors which contained information about the different types of patterns which were occurring in these sequences. Next, uh, we trained our machine learning algorithms to discriminate or classify um, sequences based on the um, annotated classes that we had given them here. And specifically, um, we are using what's called supervised machine learning, which is where you give your machine learning algorithm some data that's classified into, say, these bins, dark, green, red, and very red. And then it will learn how to discriminate. Um, I put some details here for those of you who might be working on stuff like this, and I'm happy to answer questions. Then once we had trained our sets of machine learning classifiers, we took um, some of these motifs that we had found from this mining step here, pieced them together, and then ran them through our machine learning classifier to see which ones were predicted to be the color that we were aiming towards. And then finally, we tested them with our robot again. So how well did this work? Um, let me show you some of our results. The gray bars here, they're also thicker um, if you're colorblind. The gray bars are our initial data set that we call training data. This is what we trained our algorithms on to um, distinguish among the different types of silver clusters. 
when we used our trained algorithms to design green clusters, um, that's we would expect them to be within this uh, region of the histogram, we were able to, with some modest success, um, concentrate most of our designs within that green region. We were much more successful in the near infrared, uh, moving out into the near infrared, with this so-called very red class. So this was exciting. Um, there was a limitation to this, and that is, I haven't told you this, but we were using only 10 base DNA strands so far, and many other experimentalists use different lengths, longer lengths. Um, so we later expanded our method to arbitrary lengths and showed that it worked with some constraints. So next, um, what we are doing now is we're moving into the near infrared. And the reason why we're doing this um, is because if you look at your biological tissues, they are much more transparent in the near infrared. So I don't know how many of you have ever scared your sibling by sticking a flashlight in your mouth um, and you know that your face glows red. If you haven't done it, there's still time, it's fun. <laughs> um, but this is also really useful. That's because you can use near infrared, infrared light to probe much deeper into the body than visible light. Um, and this could be useful for medical imaging, for example. But the problem is we don't have too many things, molecules, nanoparticles, et cetera, which emit a lot of near infrared light. So we are looking for near infrared silver clusters, even out here where we haven't um, discovered any, the reddest ones we've discovered so far are here, well within the near infrared. Um, and this is within this window where not very many of our biological tissues are absorbing, scattering or emitting light. So in order to do this, um, we designed a custom spectrometer. This was work led by my former collaborators at UC Santa Barbara, Stephen Swayze and Hunter Nicholson um, and Elizabeth Gwynn. And by looking into the near infrared, even at the silver clusters that we had initially designed but couldn't see into the near infrared when we did that design, we found I'm just going to say it out loud so in case she hears us that she knows. Uh, nationals. Um, Stacy, you had um, actually cut out or froze. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. What was Thank the last you. thing that you guys heard or that somebody heard? So she knows where she left off. I don't, I'm sorry. It was like you were circling around the square with the, <laughs> with the blue and pretty. Dark. Oh, this thing here? Yeah. When you first started kind of talking, you're circling around it. Ah, okay. Thank you for, for letting me know because I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, so this is this is basically a map of different DNA stabilized silver clusters that emit within the near infrared. And you can look at this uh, heat map here to see what the colors are of those silver clusters. So by um, looking out in the near infrared with this new detector, um, we are able to find these near infrared silver clusters basically hiding in plain sight. And now we're examining them in much more detail. And um, I'm gonna show you just a few of the candidates before I wrap up. Um, here is one silver cluster um, that emits in the near infrared at about 730 nanometers. Um, for those who do optical materials, I put in the whole excitation versus emission map if you're curious. Uh, this cluster is actually also the one that uh, we got this structure from, or rather our colleagues got this structure from. So that's very exciting. And it has a pretty high quantum yield of about 26% for a near infrared material. We also discovered one that our collaborators um, at the University of Copenhagen found to be really brightly fluorescent uh, with a 73% quantum yield. That means that 73% of the photons coming in lead to photons going out. Um, this is really exciting. And we found one um, that is almost at this 1000 nanometer mark. Um, and it can be detected even at the single molecule or single, single cluster level. So we're moving towards the point where we think we'd be able to design these for bioimaging applications. So I'm gonna wrap up there. Um, I told you a little bit about my path to materials physics and um, biophotonics. I told you about this challenge of realizing precise nanostructures for nanophotonics and how we're using DNA to build atomically precise silver clusters um, that could potentially be used for bioimaging. And I wanna leave you um, with my vision for 
building new functional materials um, by understanding the physics and chemistry of these types of macromolecular building blocks. I'm hoping that throughout my career, um, me and my collaborators, that we can understand how these molecules fit together through this self-assembly process so well that they become like little molecular Legos. And eventually we're able to create the types of complex structures that biology can create um, for applications from medical imaging to energy, to biosensing, to photonics. So I'm gonna finish there. Um, I'm gonna thank my students. This is an old picture, obviously, from when we could see each other face to face. Um, but I also have many great collaborators that I wanna thank as well as our funding agencies. And most of all, I wanna thank you for your attention and I do look forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much, Professor Kopp, for the amazing talk. So as usual, if you have any questions, you're welcome to type them in the chat or you can raise your hand and then uh, ask them aloud. So it looks like we already have our first question from Alex. So Alex, if you'd like to lead us off. Oh, uh, first question was, you talked about how these uh, uh, materials become excited under black light and that's when the fluorescence activates. Is it possible to use other wavelengths of light in order to activate fluorescence? And if so, what would be, is it, do you know what we'd be looking for there if it was a, a excited under different? Yes, uh, let me see, let me go back to the, uh, I'm gonna guess, ha, ah, I guessed right. Okay, it was slide 23. Okay, um, so this is what's called an absorbance spectrum, actually, um, not a fluorescence emission spectrum. So this is showing you the unique um, wavelengths of light that each cluster will absorb and then turn into fluorescence. Um, and each of these are related very specifically to the size and shape of the cluster. Conveniently also, um, we can use, uh, excuse me, UV light because it turns out our DNA absorbs UV light, which is why you shouldn't go out in the sun for too long. <laughs> um, and so we use UV light to excite the clusters in what we call high throughput. So we can shine just one color on them and then measure their optical spectra. But you're right, they do also have this unique thumbprint in a sense of uh, light in an, another region of the visible or near infrared spectrum. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I also see a question in the chat from Lynn Kaminsky. Oh. I also want to say one thing really quickly. So Alex is one of our graduating students and I, if he doesn't mind me mentioning, he'll actually be going to BC Irvine for his PhD starting. Specifically as part of the CHAMP program in physics. Right, which leads oh. to the next question. <laughs> okay, very exciting. Uh, well, we're looking forward to welcoming you to UCI then. Is that through the physics department or one of the other? Uh, oh, it is yes. through CHAMP, which is associated with physics and material sciences and okay. chemistry. Okay, cool. Um, okay, Lynn is asking me to, I actually don't know who Lynn is, by the way, but I thank you for typing in questions. Um, so CHAMP is, let me go to the last slide, which I think actually has the um, acronym that I don't ever remember. <laughs> Okay, it's the Chemical and Materials Physics Graduate Program. They actually also added applied physics in there. Uh, and I don't know where it goes anymore. So the acronym got longer. Uh, but this is a really exciting program that is at UC Irvine. And it's a cross departmental program, um, primarily in physics and chemistry. But we also have students from material science and engineering, chemical engineering, and biomolecular engineering. And the program starts the year or the summer before you would start the regular academic quarter. So I believe it starts in July. We're a little off this year because things are partially remote. Um, but you get to begin research. You get to take um, specific classes at the intersection of materials, physics, and chemistry. Um, and it's also geared towards not only academic careers, but um, industry and national lab careers. I think it's been going for about 15 years now because I met someone who did it about 15 years ago. Um, and it's really, students really enjoy it. So you get hands-on training on some of our amazing electron microscopes, at least you did <laughs> before COVID. I'm not sure what you get to do this summer. I highly encourage people to check it out if you're thinking about graduate school and please um, shoot me an email as well. I'm on the advisory board now. Awesome. So um, it's 5.01. So unless if someone raises their hand real quick, 
or types in one more question, we might just end there. All right, I'm not seeing anything. So with that, um, thank you everyone for joining today for our last What Physicists Do of the Semester. I hope to see you all again in the fall semester. And thank you again so much, Professor Kopp, for the, the excellent talk. Thanks so much for attending, especially for the last one of the semester. <laughs>